Yes, hello there. Still got some energy left after all these deep dives. Well, that's really an uh, enthusiastic reaction, but yeah, that's fine. I uh, will take it a little bit lighter today. So my name is Michel Schudel. I'm a uh, software developer for a company called Craftsman in the Netherlands. It's a consultancy company. And because it's a consultancy company, um, I tend to go to a lot of different projects and I see a lot of different code bases, uh, certainly not least my own. And Either when I open up the test folder uh, of one of these projects, or mostly also projects, I also work it and contributed it. After a while, looks like this. Looks familiar? So, mocks everywhere, Spring Boot tests everywhere. And normally this says something about um, uh, your application structure. At least the test structure, that's clear enough. But also, maybe there's something with your production code. Uh, so this normally is also an indication of unclear layer separation because you need a lot of IT tests to run everything because otherwise it doesn't work, etc. Now, uh, there are a couple of architectural patterns that have emerged over the years. Some are quite old actually, and uh, to combat this. And that's what I'm going to talk about today and how to test it. So one of those is the Onion architecture. Now, you might have also heard clean architecture, hexagonal architecture, stuff like that. It's there are some small differences in approach and naming, but it's more or less the same. So the idea is that you make a layer structure of your application. So you start with your application core. That contains the domain objects that you use, or some colored entities, and then some services that you need to orchestrate some stuff around those domain objects. But then still, yeah, you have your logic, but you want to have access to it. So either by some external reference. So you need something to access this uh, this, yeah, this ball of business logic. And also, this ball of business logic might need some persistency or some external service to get data from. So, that's where the adapters come in. So, these are the outer layers of your application. And you can have, for example, presentation adapter, which may be REST controllers or API or something like that. Uh, but also persistency, so database or a file. Or maybe what's something we call gateways. So, for example, REST client to another system, or maybe some messaging bus that you want to access. So, these are basically the goal of these uh, layers is to make get access to this application core. Now, um, the idea is that you can have outside independencies. So, from presentation to services or to application core is fine, but not the other way around. Okay. So that means that if you peel this off like an onion and you get to the application core, this thing will still work by itself because it doesn't need the outside. So, good to remember. Out to in, okay. In to out, don't do it. Yeah? So if you translate this to an application, for example, I will just uh, take a normal application that you're used to. So, for example, if you have a barista order service that you can use to take in an order and maybe get an order out of the system, you would have something like this. So we have an order service. This is a service in the application core. It may be some domain objects and maybe some extra business logic that you want to use, for example, price converter. And then to make use of this, you can, for example, write a controller, so a REST controller or something else that is part of your presentation layer. So you can access it. Uh, but then again, this application core might need something external. So for example, you want to have a database to store orders in, or if I want to have the latest and greatest price of this order, of this espresso, for example, uh, I want to make a call to headquarters to see what the latest price is. So I probably need some classes for that as well. Now, how do you access these? Because you're not allowed to make a direct dependency from order service to these repositories or, for example, price rest clients. So how do you solve this? This is the way. So you define some interfaces that are part of your core. So the application core still doesn't know anything about these yellow and green uh, classes. And then at runtime, you use dependency injection to get these classes running in the system. So that's the basic idea. So I have prepared a little example application. So I will um, show that real quick. Um, let's see, is this readable from the back? Ah, I see thumbs up, that's, that's cool. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's already running, um, well, I won't bother you with, uh, so you, I have an order service here and that you can run and then you will see that um, it will be stored in the system, so this is really CRUD operation-like, right? 
And also you have uh, orders here that you can get back, so one. And if everything is okay, you will receive that as well. Uh, so yeah, I have an order controller here, which you've probably seen a thousand times, but that's the, I, I try to keep the domain very simple. Uh, so there's a controller and that has a order service, so that is the ingoing dependency in the application core. And I have a mapper here that does some view model to domain model mappings. And you probably maybe wonder, oh, okay, this is not a Spring component. Yeah, that's correct, more on that later. Uh, so I have two very simple methods, one to save an order, so it receives a uh, request model, and then it maps it to the order domain object, it saves the order to the service, so that's all really simple. And then maybe you'll get a response model back as well. And uh, there's a second method to get the order from the system based on the ID. Uh, so that's a <coughs> really simple call to the order service. You get a response model back as well. So that is a really simple layer, no business logic whatsoever. So if we drill down a little bit to the service itself, you will see here on the left side that is actually part of the application core. So this has no dependencies on controllers or whatsoever. Um, it has two dependencies. One is an orders provider, so this is for persistency. And the other one is uh, what I call here a price provider to get price from headquarters. Now, if you look at these interfaces, they're really simple. So saving an order, finding an order by the, that's it. That's all the application core needs to know. Uh, same for the price provider. I put in a name of the product and I will get a price back, which is a simple double, really simple. Um, then I have some business logic here, which is a price converter, which I will use later on. And the idea is here that when I save a new order, I will get the price from headquarters first. Oh, sorry. That's this part. I will convert it to cents, so that is my piece of intricate, very complex business logic. And then um, you enri enrich the incoming order with the price, and you store this in the database. So really simple uh, domain logic, basically. So. Uh, let's drown, d drill down any further ag uh, again. So if you look at this interface, uh, orders provider, um, it is actually part of, and let's see, oh, sorry, <laughs> I was clicking wrong. Uh, I need the implementation, yeah. So now we're in the persistency layer, as you can see on the left-hand side. And it just contains two methods. So this is a little down and dirty, so I use default methods on an interface. So for those of you who don't know, this is Spring Data JPA, which allows you to make um, uh, queries to your database declaratively, very simple. Uh, it saves the order to the database and it returns it, so very simple again. There's an order mapping here as well, which just maps to an entity to and forth. There are no ifs or business logic or whatever. Um, that's the orders repository. And then the other thing was the price provider. So if I go to that, that's a simple REST client that goes to the outside world. So I have an endpoint here, price, and I could put in the name of a product, and you will get a price response model, which then contains a price. Of course, all nice records we have now in Java 17. So that is the basic structure of this application. So you've seen that the actual service um, has no uh, dependencies to the outside world whatsoever. So, uh, that's a quick overview of what I'm going to show you. Um, where is it? Yeah, so some, uh, I, 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 will, I hate to call it best practices because it never is best practice, but it might be a good practice. So, when you're working with this architecture, make your adapters very thin. So, they're only meant for providing entry and exit points to and from your application core. So it should no contain no business logic whatsoever. So uh, yeah, maybe except maybe some view model to entity uh, to domain model mapping, and on the lower side maybe some uh, domain model to entity mapping. But that's it. Put everything else in the application core itself. <coughs> um, the application core contains all, all business logic and has no external infra dependencies whatsoever. Now once you do this, your application core can be tested very fast because there are no databases or REST endpoints or whatever to speak of. It's all can be done by unit tests, so it runs really, really quick. Um, also, because your uh, layers, or sorry, your adapters contain no business logic, there's very little points, except maybe a few exceptions, um, to run, to test these with unit tests, because they don't tell you anything. What you want to know of these adapters, do they work with my infrastructure, with a database, for example? Can I talk to an external system? Do the REST endpoints work? That's what I want to know. 
Um, so, test adapters by using IT tests to set up infrastructure and not unit tests. So, basically, application core pure unit tests, uh, outer layers or adapters, IT tests. But I hear you think. So, yeah, IT tests, but that take a long time to run and uh, endlessly takes up to start up a Spring Boot application. Uh, yeah, true, but um, do you really need all that stuff that is started up at the beginning? Because there are other ways to do it. So let's look at Spring Boot, for example. So you see this everywhere, right? In the test folder. So this indeed spins up your entire application. Uh, there are ways around it, but what uh, Spring has done is in, uh, introduced the concept of test slice annotations. So this allows you to start up just part of your application. Now, I'm going to pick out a few here to demo. Uh, for example, one is um, uh, Web MVC. Uh, well, the first three I will uh, demo for you. There are loads more. Um, the URL at the bottom uh, gives you an exhaustive list of everything that exists. And also, at the uh, real bottom, the, the last URL that points you to a um, article that uh, shows you how to make custom ones. It's the Spring Boot 1.4, but the article itself still holds up. So that's a good reference to uh, if you want to make your own slice. So I'm just going to show you one of these, uh, one of these three. Uh, well, we, I'm going to show you these three, and I'll just go them first with graphics, and then I will show you the code. That's easier. So the order controller is first. I want to test this. So uh, what do I really need in this IT test? Only this. So I start up my controller, I start up the MVC framework. I have to mock out the service because I have a direct dependency on that. And then I can write an IT test, annotate it with web MVC test. And then you can choose, okay, you have to talk to this MVC framework, so you can do that by either using mob MVC, which is utterly, automatically uh, provided by Spring. Or what I really like is you can use rest assured, but I'm sure there are lots of other clients you can use as well. So that is what I'm going to show you in a minute. Now, for the pressurized client, it's also an adapter. Um, you can use something called REST client test, and that only spins up this part of the application. Now, you have the additional problem here that uh, you have something to talk to, right? Because there has to be an endpoint on the other side. So you can do that either by using uh, something called mock REST server server, which is provided by Spring as well. Um, or what I really like, you can uh, spin up Wiremock and talk to that. So you can uh, define all these nice stuffs that you can talk to. I, I, I like that very much. And then last but not least is testing the repository. So that is the persistency. Uh, same thing. You can uh, write, for example, a, JDA, a data JPA test, which I'm going to use. So if you're using JPA, that will only spin up the JPA part plus your class. Or <coughs> if you're using... Um, uh, Spring JDBC, for example, you can use an annotation for that one, so that's very similar. Also, same thing here, uh, you have to have something to talk to, so you can either use, for example, a memory database, uh, H2, or what I really like, you can use test containers uh, to spin up, for example, an, either an H2 database or the real one, so I'm going to show you PostgreSQL as a demo. So, let's dive right into it, I hope it doesn't go like this. Um, but uh, I will just go to the uh, do the tests, okay? So uh, first one was the controller. So uh, there's a IT. T hmm. Oh, sorry. Yes. Still not. Oh, I'm searching. Oh, okay. Let's do this by hand. Let's do this by hand then. All right. I might have to, oh, not, not too much, but I might have to zoom in a little bit here. So, order controller IT, that is used for the presentation layer, so has nothing to do with your application core. Um, uh, oh, I already run it, well, it doesn't matter. Um, annotated with web MVC tests, you need a mock bean, so that's the only dependency this controller has. You have to mock that out because it's not provided by Spring in this context. And for rest assured, which I really like, which I'm using here, you have to uh, do some wiring here. Um, there's a link at the end of this presentation that will provide you with the repository where all these examples are contained, so you can 
take your time in a reaction and look at it a little bit. Uh, but you have to use some setup. And if you've done that, you can start writing your tests. So for example, if I want to store an order, I have to specify the behavior to this mock service first, so which is like Mokito. Yeah, well, you know Mokito, right? Uh, when they save a new order, then a new order will be returned from the system containing an ID and also the price, because that's part of the domain logic. And then uh, I have to set up a request model here that I'm going to send to the MVC framework. So I'm going to give Stefan a coffee, because I think he really needs it by now. An espresso. And then I do a call to the web layer. So for those of you who are not familiar with Rest Assured, it's a very nice declarative DSL-like uh, language that you can use to send requests to your application, or uh, at least the uh, endpoint part of your application. So if I run this, now this is not a Mac machine, so it's not, not as quick as you might expect. <coughs> well, still running, you see the Spring Boot application uh, coming live here. And uh, you see that only the web MVC part has started. You can see here there's done a, a post method being done here. I hope this is readable from the back. Uh, with this uh, request model and a response model comes back. So that's how you can really quickly test your web layer. Right? So now uh, the other methods are more of the same. Uh, so this is one that should result in a bad request, for example. I will just build a model and that will give me a bad request because there are, there are no parameters in there because it's validated. And of course, I can also write one for an existing order, but I'm not going to repeat that. I think you know what this entails, okay? So next up, uh, the REST clients. So you can either do that uh, by using um, uh, um, mockrest server server, which you see here. So you annotate a test with REST client test. You have to specify the class under test because uh, Spring has to know what template to inject. And then you auto wire the REST client and then you can just say, okay, this is my basically my mock object, my mock server. So I say, okay, when a request to price espresso comes in, I respond with a price. So really easy. Then I can actually do a call to that and then whatever comes back, I can assert that's actually what I expect. Yes, come on. Well, you see again here in the Spring Boot context, no JPA or anything gets started up, only the stuff I need. So that is what I wanted to tell you. And the express price is correct, so I do a logging here, otherwise you are not really able to see anything. So the other one is a wire mock, which I really like. Um, it's basically the same, it's also a REST client test, but you can also specify this, how to configure wire mock, and it will spin up a wire mock server for you to talk to. Now, the test is exactly the same, so I'm not going to repeat that. But in order to make this work, you have to add a little bit of more test configuration. So you have to inject the port that Wiremox is actually running on, and then make sure the REST template builder gets injected with the new URI to localhost, because you know it's running on your local host, except you don't know the port. So that's provided by uh, Spring Injection. But it's exactly the same thing, so the uh, result will also be the same, I hope. <coughs> yeah, there it goes, and if all goes well, you also see that you now uh, have a wire mocked up that has been matched. Oh, I forgot to tell you that. Uh, so you see a, uh, what is it, a, a class path here that points to stops. So there's a directory stops on my system, that is here. And that contains all of my wire mock, mock responses. So I really like this. You can take it out of your code and put it somewhere else. And this is much more readable than a mock rest, uh, um, mock rest server server, I, is my opinion. So that is the rest part. And now we'll continue to the, um, uh, to the persistency part. So when you want to test to store an order in a database, you can do it either embedded or by test containers. Uh, or a few others, but these are the ones I'm going to show you. Uh, so uh, this is the embedded test. Um, what you see here is I get a repository injected. Then I set up an order and I will store it here. I um, do some logging and then retrieve it again and see 
if that actually still has all the stuff that I put in. So if I run this, You can see here it starts up. I hope I hope I can retrieve it again. Yeah, you can see it, it now starts up the JPA stack here, and also Flyway is included. So I have a Flyway script for the. You probably know that, right? Flyway, uh, a Flyway script that uh, is run to create the initial table, so that is automatically started as well. It contains here in DB migration. So this is uh, a script that's run for each IT test. Now, this is one way to do it. You can also do it by um, test containers. Uh, the configuration is, well, almost the same, except you have to get the uh, H2 database out of the way because that will be loaded first because I specified an H2 driver. Now, in order to make this work, you have the property file here that uh, specifies a little bit different properties. So instead of an H2 driver, you have here a test container driver. And then you can here specify the uh, kind of database that you want to run. So there's an exhaustive list here, so you can find that inside the project. But for, for example, PostgreSQL, this is enough to make it work. So if I run this, I hope you can actually see a Docker image being started. Yes, you see the blue thingy here, that's always good news. And you see your test container that's being started up. Now, it's still starting up. Um, ignore that. <laughs> uh, that was actually uh, like a, a clop type is not supported, so it's not really interfering with my tests. Uh, but then again, uh, the test code is exactly the same. So uh, just storing something and retrieving it again. So there's very little difference between embedded database and test container database. So those were the few things I wanted to show you about IT tests, so you can play around with it a little bit and make sure that you only use the slices you need. Um, so let's go back for a moment, uh, because, oh yeah, one more thing. Um, that's also included in the demo project, but I don't have enough time. You can also use uh, test slices for messaging, for example, either embedded using test containers or start it yourself with Docker, but you can play around it in the example project. Now, what I didn't talk about was the application core yet. Um, so, um, still, if you open the test, test for the application core for the business logic, you see a lot of this stuff, right? So, mocks everywhere, captors in jet mocks, and it's all over the place. And uh, the reason why that is, is normally, and this is the same thing I built for years and years, everything is a component. So, dependency injection is used everywhere. Um, uh, so if you want to test this, you have to basically write a test for every class and you have to mock everything out. And as you might be able to understand that um, if you want to shuffle around some logic in here, it becomes really hard to do that because you have to change all your tests as well. Uh, it's, it's really a pain. So this is an example of tightly coupled tests. So it's really tightly coupled to the application code on a very low level. And maybe there's another way to do this. So I'd like to think of two things. So first thing is a unit test is not a class test. Can be, uh, can certainly be if the class is complex and you want to test that separately, but it doesn't need to be. And the second thing is uh, a lot of classes, and I'm going out a little bit on a limb here, some, but I dare to say most classes have very little complexity in terms of code branches. So for example, if you look at a mapper, it's just uh, one code branch that basically does something. There are no ifs in there, lots of time no loops also. So do you really also always need to do that in that way? Do you really need to test every class separately or can you do it differently? So um, for example, instead of this, you do something like this. So you use more uh, default constructors, not components everywhere. And maybe you have a complex helper there on the on the right hand side, but and you have to really test that separately. But um, look at it as this. So you have two units now, and you can test them separately. But you don't need to test every single class in single class in there separately because if there's no um, code branches in there, 
you can just test the order surface. So you still probably need a lot of mock, uh, a few mocks, but far less. And of course, when you see if I shuffle around something in this big unit, it doesn't change the test. So don't do it for everything, but think of loosely coupled tests and try to work towards that because it will help you greatly in to be able to uh, maintain and refactor uh, your application. Um, Let's see, I still have five minutes. So yeah, a very small uh, demo, that is. Uh, so I have the order service test here. So this is the test for the actual business logic. I'm not going to walk through it, uh, every, everything, but you see here, uh, the test price conversion is now part of this test and not a separate uh, conversion. So, um, well, you probably believe if I run it, this is this turns green, and I hope this even quicker because this is just a normal unit test. Yeah. So, for example, if I would now go to the order surface, and again, this is a very simple example. Um, this one, and I would decide to go to the price converter, and now just pull this up. So now it's part of the order surface itself. I inlined it somewhere. Yeah, here. Um, the um, order service test will not change and I can still run it. So at least think a little bit about this, whether you need to test every class. And it's green. Yeah, cool. Um, I have some time left, so I want to show you one extra thing. I talked about onions, uh, onion architectures and layers. So if there is there a way to actually formally test this, if your layers are correctly? Yes, there is. So um, there's something called um, ArchUnit, a library, and that allows you to specify the packages that contain your models, your domain services, and your application services. So these are all part of the core package in my case. So two dots mean that, uh, yeah, it's like a wildcard. And the adapters are presentation, persistence, and gateway. So if I run this, no, not debug. Stop, stop. Well, still starting up. Uh, it will probably not complain because uh, everything is in order in my application. But for example, if I would now go to the uh, order service and I would introduce, uh, let's say, uh, um, I would just point it to the order controller. That's not allowed, right? Like this. And I run it again. Now let's hope it will fail. Yes, it does. So now you get you get a error that it says architecture violation, and you're doing something wrong. So it basically specify here order controller. Uh, uh, has type order control in order service. You're not allowed to do that. So that's a really nice way to make sure your layers are still in order. Uh, okay, so to summarize. Uh, using Onion Architecture helps to maximize fast tests for your business logic because you can do everything with unit tests. Um, so unit tests for application core, IT tests for adapters, and make sure you use test slices if possible. Now, if you're working with Quarkus or Micronaut, they have similar concepts, uh, but to be honest, you really need less of them because they tend to start up a little bit faster. But okay, Spring Boot is still evolving and it is, uh, yeah, it's getting faster all the time. And think of for your application core work towards loosely coupled tests for your application because that really helps you in maintenance and uh, shuffling things around. So that's all I wanted to uh, tell you. I hope you can take some tips away from this. So if you want to play around with the examples, there's a GitLab hub link here. Um, I'll be here still and also tomorrow. So please walk up to me if you have any questions later and uh, rate me in the app. And thank you very much.